Good morning. Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Michael Jarbo, lead pastor here at The Journey. I just want to say welcome, and I want to explain something to you and what you just witnessed um, before I walked on stage. So Lauren is going through um, uh, foot surgery. She had foot surgery a week or two ago, and until for the next few weeks, we're going to have kind of guest people doing children's time, but I have seen, because of this, what we just watched, the application process needs to be much more difficult. Um, <laughs> Donuts, donuts, it changes everything, doesn't it now? When you think about a donut, thank you, uh, thank you Drew for that, thank you Khalil, Ginny, no hand motions, it all worked well. Anywho, uh, man, we've been, uh, it's so good to see you, thank you for being in worship today. Uh, today we also are going to get to honor our seniors in a little bit, which will be great, but before we do that, we're going to jump into uh, this sermon series that we're already in week four or five with, um, uh, I think it's week five, uh, when we're looking at the Beatitudes. Um, uh, these are these words of wisdom that Jesus gave uh, in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. We see that in Matthew 5, and we've been hanging out in Matthew 5 for the past few weeks, and it's been challenging because these like you saw in the video, they turn the world kind of upside down. They're, they're not typical wisdom moments that we all know and love and what we think the world is supposed to be like. Jesus turns it upside down, and we've been looking each week, going scripture by scripture. It's been fun to watch how Matthew 5 has grown longer and longer because of adding more Beatitudes to the list. Today, we're going to read up till. Uh, verse 9. Um, so if you've got your Bibles, feel free to open to Matthew 5. If you've got a smartphone and that's where you look at your Bible, awesome. Uh, turn it open there or it'll be on the screen uh, as you're here. Again, I just want to say thanks for being in worship today. Glad you're here. Matthew 5, chapter 1, so, excuse me, Matthew 5, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Hear these words. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and began to teach them. He said things like this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And here's today's text. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. This, my friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God. And together we say, thanks be to God. Amen. So one of the things I'm uh, particularly pumped about this summer is the, uh, uh, the uh, addition of Colin Bagby, uh, Reverend Colin Bagby, onto our pastoral staff in July. It's going to be a great addition. Him and his wife, Landon, who are coming from Arkansas, the Little Rock area, are going to be awesome. Uh, a great new couple to join the memorial area. And I just want to brag on y'all for just a little bit uh, in saying this, that you all do a very good job. Memorial Drive does an excellent job in welcoming in their pastors. I know from firsthand experience. Hard to believe it was 2014 when Leslie and I uh, took a U-Haul down from Chicago to Houston to move here. But when we got here, we were welcomed so warmly. Uh, and not only through handwritten notes, which we got a ton of them from many of you all, but we got things like homemade meals and flowers and a ton of different gift cards. And even some of you gave us bottles of wine which we graciously accepted into our hearts and our palates. It was a, a welcomed uh, gift. But one gift, uh, per se, stood out from them all. I'll tell you why. It was a few weeks in, and I was over in the sanctuary. I just finished three services over there, still in my robe and stole. And I was in the narthex area, the lobby, with Leslie. And this older woman started walking our way. And she came up to us, and she goes, Hello, my name is Norma and I have a special gift for you. And from behind her, she showed us this. If you can't see it from a far ways away, it says, Norma's favorite things. Now, she paused for just a minute, and I have a feeling Leslie and I both thought the same thing was, what's in the book? I mean, there must be a multitude of things that could be Norma's favorite. What could possibly be in this special book? And we opened it, and to our surprise and to our joy, it's a list of recipes. 
tons of different recipes. There are soups, and there are stews, and squash casserole, and a chocolate mousse uh, recipe, and even a, like, beef wellington that looks very good. And before we could say thanks, Norma, and kind of introduce ourselves a little bit more, she said, these recipes have fed my, genera- my family for generations, and they have fed generations of pastors just like you. Do not substitute any of the ingredients <laughs> that I give you. And if you follow all of the instructions, your future will be delicious. And with that, she pulled out a magical wand and vanished in thin air. No, that didn't happen. But it felt like, like this like fairy godmother had come and stepped in my life with this magical book of recipes. It was, it was so kind and just a, a sweet gesture um, for, for me and Leslie and welcoming us into this community. You know, I don't know if it's helped you, friends, but it really has helped me to look at Jesus' beatitudes through the lens of different metaphors. Uh, Maybe for you, the metaphor of that Polaroid camera I talked about a few weeks ago helped. Or last week, when I talked about that patient parent uh, uh, from the front seat turning around and looking back and saying, we're not there yet, hold fast. Um, And then this week, of course, with uh, this idea of maybe looking at the Beatitudes as a recipe book. Because you see, friends, the, the practice of taking conventional experiences that we know and turning them upside down is exactly what Jesus was best at. He took the, what the world told us would make us blessed. You can call it maybe the recipe of success, right? Pride, power, wealth, fame. And he said, no, that's not it. Those who are blessed are weak and meek and are the ones who are mourning. And that was really hard for people to grasp to get their minds around this new reality. Which brings me to something that came to my attention this week as I was studying the Beatitudes that I didn't realize. That like Miss Norma's recipe book, (laughs) there are no substitutes or changes offered in the Beatitudes. There's no asterisk in Matthew 5 anywhere that points that says, if you don't want to live a merciful life, try this non-fat, non-dairy version of it. It works just as well. No, it's not there, y'all. It isn't. Jesus gives us a recipe for how the world is supposed to be. And with that, I must tell you, I feel very convicted by today's particular beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be known as children of God. I had to look at that more and more this week. Because it doesn't say peace-wishers. It doesn't say lack of peace complainers. It doesn't even say, blessed are the peaceful, but the peacemakers. What does it mean to make peace in the world? To be honest with you, as I was looking forward to this sermon uh, in the distance, as we planned them out earlier in the year, I thought to myself, I might bring in a friend to help me preach this sermon. I have no shame asking for some help, y'all. And I know some great people doing great work in peacemaking. I can think about my friend Hannah Terry, uh, who has recently uh, focused in on an article in the Houstonian Magazine. She works with Fondren Apartment Ministry here in Houston in the Sharpstown neighborhood. And she helps these refugees come and find peace in their new home. Or I think of my buddy Samuel from seminary, a a native uh, to south side of Chicago life. And he works for a company, uh, excuse me, an organization called Faith in Action Illinois. And and it helps to prevent gun violence down on the south side of Chicago with peace conversations between rival gangs. And if I had an endless budget, I would fly in Father Elias Shakur. That's him with the Pope right there, who spent his heroic ministry, wrote a book called Blood Brothers, If you haven't read it, read it next week. It's that good. He spent his ministry right there on the border of the Israeli-Palestinian border, helping to create peace between two warring countries, even when he was shot at, even when his family's life was threatened. Those are peacemakers. But you see, me, my expertise 
is in peacekeeping. Oh, baby. I am the king. I am in the hall of fame of peacekeeping. I am a stud at saying, let's not talk about it anymore. I am the pro at let's just squash the conversation. Only good vibes here, friends. Let's keep it easy. Let's turn up the music at Thanksgiving and at Christmas when frustrations and anger occur just to keep the peace. But the truth is, there is a difference with peacekeeping and peacemaking. Peacekeeping requires little of us. It requires no initiative. It requires no awkwardness. But peacemaking does. You can ask any of those names that you just saw up there on the screen or thousands of others who have worked their life, even lost their life in the art of making peace. See, friends, to make peace, you have to get busy. You have to act. You have to get to work. Jesus does not say in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who are passive and do nothing. Jesus says, blessed are the doers of peace. So let's make that distinction real clear right up at the front. There is a difference, and Jesus calls us to make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. My friend Ashley, a few months ago, won Miss Lubbock, Texas. And this weekend, she's been competing in the Miss Texas competition. And her Facebook has been just flooded with all sorts of congrats and things. And she's been giving updates from along her uh, journey. And one thing she said kind of in a funny fashion, she said, you know, I've got to be careful during the interviewing process that I don't fall into the pageant queen, like, bubble of going. And when they ask me, what does you, what do you want most in the world that I don't say what? World peace, right? That's an easy answer, not only for pageant queens, but for us. What do we want in the world? We want world peace. It's common for us all to want that. But what is it? And more importantly for today, friends, what did Jesus think of peace? Jesus grew up in a a Hebrew community, and one word, a great word in in the Hebrew faith and language is the word shalom. And for Jews, they used the word shalom as a greeting and a blessing as they sent people away. It's sort of our version of howdy and see you later right? And they said, when, when you're leaving, when you come into their presence, you say, shalom, peace. And then when people are departing on their way, you say, peace. Now, this is nice. Be nice to, for people to tell me peace more often. But what did the word actually mean? Because I think it's important for us to know what that really meant, because when we speak of t- t- peace today, I think sometimes our mind goes to peace is just the absence of conflict and of strife. But the word is much more powerful than that. We see peace not as a quality in itself from freedom, but we see it as a negative state, as a a distance from a negative state. But true meaning of peace, as one would say, is anything that makes for, uh, for a person of higher good. Anything that makes for a person of higher good is that word shalom and peace. I like even more how one Jewish scholar goes a little deeper and says, For him, the understanding of the word shalom is completeness. And so when you are with a person and they are entering your presence or they're about to go, in a way, when you're saying shalom, you're saying to them, may you be complete. Interesting. Let me ask you, what does it look like in your life to feel complete? Peace, my friends, in the biblical sense is much more than just silencing guns and stopping war, though that's important. But peace is a meaning and a place of fulfillment. It's a place of well-being and fullness. The late, great Dr., uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., one of those who died in the process of making peace in the world, received the Nobel Peace Prize, excuse me, in 1964. And he received it uh, for his work with racial justice. And one of the things that was interesting is he was receiving it right in the midst and the, and the heat of the Vietnam War in the, in the 60s. And it was also during a time where U.S. enemies were kind of gathering up, stockpiling all of their weaponry for the future. And when 
Martin Luther King received that award, he, he has a speech and he gave it about the current political climate of the time. And I think it was appropriate, the words he said for the moment that it was. He said this in his acceptance speech. speech. He said, we must shift the arms race into a peace race. <laughs> If we have the will and determination to mount such a peace offensive, we can unlock the tightly sealed doors of hope and transform our imminent cosmic elegy into a psalm of creative fulfillment. Wow. Like Jesus, Martin Luther King had the ability to transform a funeral march into a song of praise, looking and a way forward toward not just being filled by war and conflict, but being filled from a completeness of heart. So this week, looking through a Jewish and a justice lens at peace, I began to think a little deeper at myself and said, perhaps, maybe, just perhaps, in order for us to be the best peacemakers we possibly can be, we first have to find peace from within. We first have to find peace from within. I mean, I don't know if that was exactly what the beatitude was trying to say, but how on earth are we supposed to share? Are we supposed to make peace with other people if we don't have peace ourselves? So let me ask you, friends, today, what kind of drama is going on in your life? What kind of discord or strife are you experiencing? And how can you work within yourself? I kept thinking when I was going over that question in my own mind, another one of Jesus' teachings from the Sermon on the Mount, just a few chapters later, where he says, we must take the plank out of our own eye first before we can go after the speck in our brother or sister's eye. That's a hard truth to swallow. Let me make it even tougher for you right now. Maybe some of us need to face the music and perhaps you're working too hard right now in your life to fix a friend's peace because it works as a nice shield from your own. You are so occupied with worried about them without dealing with your own needs first. It's like being on an airplane when the flight attendants talk about safety procedures. I never listen. You might not either. But one of the things they do teach you that's important is when that ox oxygen max O oxygen mask falls down, what do we do? We have to put it on ourselves first before we help the other. <clears throat> and unfortunately, I think for peacemaking, the same thing exists. It stands today. So now what? We know what peace is, friends. We know that we must work on ourselves before we can actually do some peacemaking, but how do we become peacemakers? Well, let me start as I've started each beatitude that we've talked about. I feel like I'm a broken record here because let me tell you guys, it takes hard work to live into these beatitudes. And I know what you're thinking, you're ill-prepared or you're ill-fit for the task. I know when you think about the global climate of our world, North Korea and Russia and Iran, and of course here in the United States, you get notification after notification on your phone when another terror attack happens, when another bombing occurs, and our proximity to war and violence is getting closer and closer and closer. Why? Because we get minute to minute updates on our devices, our social media. We know what's going on and it cripples us sometimes to such a degree that we have no way of thinking that we can play a difference and make peace. But let me bring you to some heart friends that Jesus and his disciples gathered there on the mountainside hearing these words were right in the middle of political and war um, strife right there by Roman hands. I mean, people were getting killed, crucified, for trying to bring peace. In fact, the man who shares these words in Matthew 5 will eventually be killed and crucified for his upside down wisdom. But the call for peace still remains. Jesus still says that those who do it will be blessed. And it still stands for us today. And so friends, let me tell you, if you want to if you truly want to take seriously the act of peacemaking, then we must look away from our phone notifications and start looking all around us at what we can do. 
If something begins to rise up, if someone posts a mean picture, if someone sends a nasty text or or a rude photo or a a hurtful email, you see um, something happening within your work or, or something starting, your job is to go in there and get in front of it. Do your part. Instead of being reactive, be proactive. Say, hey, I- I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let this conflict occur. So I'm going to lean into peace and be the example for those around me. Maybe for you, you're already thinking, I'm way deep in a conflict right now. Well, you have to do the hard thing. No, that's not crazy wisdom, but you have to do the hard thing. You have to. Be willing to enter into hard conversations. You have to be willing to enter, friends, into spaces that are deeply uncomfortable, places that you and I would typically flee from. It's not easy to say, oh, excuse me, it is easy to say, oh, you know what? The friendship, it's over. Oh, well, I'll just make a new one. That's not peacemaking. It's not. Peacemaking calls us in to enter into those difficult times, those hard spaces, and confess and mourn and reconcile and make new. It takes hard work. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes investment from both parties. But hear this, and you probably already know this. There is never a shortage of peacemaking. There's always work to be done. And what I've noticed in my ministry and throughout my life is those who are good at making peace are the most blessed people I know. Because you see, when we are in the business of making peace, then we are thus children of God, as the Beatitude says. Peacemaking is such a recognizable trait that when you do it, you are connected to the one who is called the Prince of Peace. When when making peace is done right, y'all, you can see the face of God. I ran into Miss Norma a few weeks ago. And I was over on the main campus. It's been almost four years, four years since I've seen her. And she walked up slowly to me, and the first question out of her mouth was, have you tried any of my recipes? And like Miss Norma, Jesus gives us this list of recipes for a blessed life, not so we can put it on the shelf and it can collect dust or I can show it on Sunday mornings and make you laugh. We have to do the work. We have to work hard for peacemaking. It's worth it. Our world depends on it. And we have to know by looking at those recipes that, man, it will taste great, but it's worth it to work hard and to actually do the making of peace every step of the way, knowing that if we do it, if we work hard, that our future, that our world, that your life will be all the more delicious. May it be so. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, for these recipes for a blessed life, um, they are hard to live out. They are upside down. They don't make sense in the world. They are difficult, to say the least. But you still call us to do them. There's no asterisk. There's no substitution. Because you believe and you know and you show us in your life that the hard work pays off, that we can share grace and peace with people who so desperately needs it. And when we do look and confront the world that we go into, when we leave this space, Lord, I ask that you strengthen us for the journey. Watch over us and lead us into peace, peace sometimes that passes understanding. That's our prayer today. We pray it in Christ's holy name. Amen.